handout. So, how many of you know we are in momentous times? I want to draw your attention to what is going on in Iran. How are we doing with the uh, PowerPoint there? American pastor Reza Sefa, a former radical Muslim and the founder of the Farsi language Christian network, has issued an urgent request for Christians around the world to pray for Iran. How many of you know that there's, there's like a revolution going on in Iran? But what you may not know is there is also revival that's breaking out in Iran in a, in a major way. He says, it's urgent that Christians around the world pray for Iran and its people as political unrest rages in the Muslim nation. Since December 28, tens of thousands of Iranian citizens have taken to the streets of the northern city of Mashhad and elsewhere to protest political oppression. At least 20 individuals have been killed in violence. He says this, this is the second time this has happened in 10 years that the people of Iran have risen up. He said, quote, for the past 39 years, the Islamic regime has done nothing but oppress the people of Iran. The Iranian people are fed up with the government's corruption and its squandering of the nation's wealth and terrorism abroad. It's, their economy is in shambles. The people are sick of it. The people are sick also of extreme Islam. They have virtually no freedom. Even the way they dress publicly is controlled by the government. However, he said, there's a difference this time. Today in Iran, the gospel is going forward as never before. The message of salvation of Jesus is impacting literally every major population center across the nation. Des despite aggressive efforts by Iran's government to stop it, over the past several years, countless thousands of Iranians have come to faith in Christ. Amen. So that today, the nation of Iran is poised for positive change. Right. Saifa emphasized the importance of Christians around the world to join together in praying for these dear saints. It's important to think in terms of the church and salvation of souls when we read historical events and political change. He says, I believe God is preparing an army of ex-Muslims to evangelize the Islamic world. Isn't that something? Wouldn't that be amazing? This is the time. This is the time for political change in Iran. Our prayers today need to be that of a proper and good government established in this nation and people loved by God. And he asks, will you join me in prayer? Would you pray with me right now? Father, we do pray for what is happening in Iran. Lord, we are in awe of you, O oh God. And Lord, it's, it is amazing the way that thousands are coming to Jesus right now. Lord, we believe this is a sovereign work of your hands. And God, I pray that the devil will not be able to stamp it out. Lord, we pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Iran as is being done in heaven. Father, we pray that heaven would come to Iran. Lord, we pray that Jesus would come to Iran. And Lord, thank you that you are there. Thank you that you're moving in power. And God, we bless those people. God, we pray that they would have courage, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're going to see some significant changes in 2018. But I want you to understand that those things we value most will never change. The times change. Seasons change. Nations change. God never changes. He cannot change. But there are new ways that God wants to express his old truths. You understand? How many of you know that God's mercies are new every morning? And, and, and the moving of God and the way God wants to deal with us and with the nations changes. What he does, how he does it, what he ultimately brings never changes. But the strategy that he will give us will change. 
And I believe we're living in a culture that is rapidly changing around us. Oh, okay. I don't know why it's not on my screen. We have it on the board. That's good. I, I'm seeing three trends. This is Reza Saifa, by the way. This lady right here took off her, this, a, a Christian lady in a, a movement there in a protest area. She takes off her hijab, hangs it on a tree in protest to the crackdown of the government. The government searched like crazy, and I understand they've found this woman and, and have arrested her. We need to stand with her and pray with her. What these people are doing is, is tremendous, and, it's, and it takes a lot of courage. Okay, here we go. I see three trends in the earth right now, our culture particularly. Number one, as a whole, the culture is moving forward, but it is also moving further and further from God in the Bible. It's important that you understand that. As a whole, the culture is moving, moving further and further from God and from the Bible. At the same time, <clears throat> not surprising, people are becoming more and more spiritually hungry. I mean, if you give up that which is the only thing that can nourish the soul, of course the soul becomes what? Hungry. And people are hungry and they're looking for God. Now they're looking in some pretty crazy places, but they're looking, they're searching. And I believe this, I believe that God is calling his people to make a radical commitment to advance his kingdom and reach this culture with the, with the gospel. Hallelujah. Are you willing to make that commitment? Let me ask that again. I believe God is calling his people to make a radical commitment. That word radical can be overused. Radical talks about the root, the very core of who we are and what we're doing, what makes your life what it is, at the very core of it, God wants us to commit to advance his kingdom and reach this culture with the gospel. Are you in? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. Now, having said that, <clears throat> I want to say that we need to understand that the church as we know it is largely irrelevant and ineffective in reaching this culture. That's not to say there aren't big churches. There are big churches, but they have almost zero impact on the culture as a whole. We continue to build bigger and build bigger congregations and buildings while the culture continues to slide into hell. What is going on? We've never had churches as big as they do in America right now, and yet the church has never had less influence in our culture than it does now. Something has to change. Something has to change, and it's got to change radically. What used to work 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago doesn't work any, anymore. The problem is most churches are still doing what didn't work 20 years ago either. And when you ask them why they're doing this, they'll tell you, well, that's the way we've always done it. They're going to chisel that on our tombstone if we aren't careful. This is the way we've always done it. Reminds me of a couple moose hunters I heard about in northern Canada. Randy Batista will like this story. They shot an unusually large moose, but they had a problem. They couldn't pack the trophy animal out of the woods. It was too big for their pack horses. But not to worry, using their sat phone, they call in <clears throat> a tiny seaplane. And when they talked the pilot into, they tried to talk the pilot into ferrying out this huge moose, the pilot said, I don't think I can take off with that much weight. Well, don't worry, we've done this before, they've said. Don't worry. So they strapped the moose in, draping it across both pontoons. Again, the pilot said, look, I, I, we're sinking awfully low in the water. I don't, I don't think this is going to work. No, don't worry. This is the way we always do it. Relax. Trust us. 
Reluctantly, the pilot agreed. He gave it the gas, he guns it. The engine takes down the runway of water. He manages to just barely get out of the water and crashes into the trees. Debris flies everywhere. Moose carcass, of course, goes sailing off into the branches of a tree. Down on the shoreline, one dazed hunter calls out to the other, hey, George, how did we do? The other guy goes, well, I think we got about 50 feet further than last year. <laughs> Just because you tried and failed something before doesn't mean we ought to keep on doing the same thing. Amen? Amen. You with me? What I'd like you to do, if you have your Bible, is uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. And what I'd like to do is look at a few scriptures that provide for us a baseline, a biblical baseline for what the church is and what the church should be doing. And then we'll talk briefly about where I think God is taking us here at the Community Vineyard Church. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts, open our minds, open our understanding. In Jesus' name. Essentially, uh, kind of, I, I don't normally put this much Bible on the screen, but I'm going to do that this morning. So I kind of want you to follow along with me. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, Jesus gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now there's about 120 of them, and they've been, they've been praying for weeks. One day, the Holy Spirit comes. Violent wind fills the whole house. What seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Say, all of them? All of them. Began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then you look a little bit further down in, in the chapter. Peter gets up and he preaches the first sermon, and it's a mighty sermon. Thousands come to Christ. 3,000 men. We don't know how many women. Could easily have been five or 6,000 people get saved right then. Verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. In other words, this is how the church began to operate. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, to the Word of God, to the Bible, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as he had need. Now you may wonder why we don't do such things today, but consider this. There is, right now, at this time, only one church in the entire world. One church. If we were, if Community Vineyard was the only church in the entire world, and, and suddenly 5,000 people move into our church. Think about that. There's about 120 people in this room right now. Imagine, suddenly we are 5,000. And these people have come from everywhere. They have nothing they're going to run out of everything would you not give all that you have to sustain this brand new baby that's being birthed in the earth of course you would and that's what they did that's what they did all the believers were together and they had everything every day they continued to meet verse 46 Are we there there it is every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes, ate together in glad and, 
sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying all the favor of the people, the Lord added to their number who were being saved. Okay, now we move to chapter 3. I want you to understand the progression. First they're praying, then they're filled. Now they're stepping out. I love it. I love it. One day, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth and was being carried to the temple called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. How many of you know he did get something from them? Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. <laughs> wow. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, began to walk, then he went with them into the temple's, temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Turned the city upside down. Turned the temple upside down. Once you turn the city upside down. And then let's look at chapter 4. Okay. Now the priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John. Because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. What? What? How many of you know the devil doesn't just lay flat because you're in a, you're in a season of revival? No, no indeed. There's going to come resistance. There's going to come a backlash, but it's okay. It's okay. But many who heard the message believed so that the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. So now we're up, I don't know, 10, 15,000 people. I love this. <clears throat> they drag Peter and John out. They're talking to the court now. And when they saw the courage Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great phrase? That these men had been with Jesus. And then here's the last one. After they prayed, the place, this is verse 31, same chapter. After they prayed, Prayed. The place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Throughout the New Testament, we see the church described but not detailed. The book of Acts describes the ministry of the apostles and the rise of the church. The New Testament epistles lay out what we believe how the church is to be governed, but we're not told in any detail exactly how to do church. I think that's because we're not supposed to do church. I think we're supposed to be the church. You hear me? <clears throat> in the New Testament, the church was the ecclesia, the gathering of the called out ones, the gathering of believers, the community of believers, if you will. They were marked by a love for God, a love for each other, and a fearlessness to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in word, deed, and power. They didn't own buildings. They hadn't invented programs yet. They didn't have video projectors. Imagine that. <clears throat> but in a single generation, they turned the world upside down. And by the end of three generations, they had transformed the entire Roman Empire. Christianity was unleashed as the greatest force for good the world has ever seen. Let me ask you a question. What do they have that we don't got? What do they have that we don't? Answer, nothing. Nothing. The title of my message this morning is Courage, Commitment, Charisma. Courage, Charisma, Commitment. 
These are the three things the early church had. And we need to recover. Let's quickly look at charisma. Charisma is a Greek word. It means the gifts of grace. Charisma. Gifts of grace. It is the divine enablement of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive dunamis power like dynamite when the Holy Spirit. That is the enablement is the Holy Spirit. That power came as the Holy Spirit filled 120 believers in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. It was that power that enabled this small group of people to turn the world upside down. The modern church has substituted programs for power. How I many of you know it hasn't worked out really well for us? Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Second thing I want to talk about is commitment. Commitment to God and to each other. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the koinonia is another Greek word. It means the, the fellowship. They loved each other. They loved one another. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Modern American Christians are barely committed to God and not committed to each other hardly at all. <laughs> we can barely make it to church and never have much contact with other believers through the week and I don't think it's because we're bad people. I just think it's we are overcommitted to other things. We are overcommitted to the wrong things. Some of them are even good things. How many of you know good is the enemy of the best? What we need to do is prioritize. For too long, American Christians have settled for the good and neglected the best. When non-Christians look at our lives, what are they filled with? Probably they are filled with too many good things. But if they aren't filled with Jesus, then those good things aren't so good, are they? If they're not kingdom things, they are second best or third best. And frankly, people in the world can find that stuff on their own. Thank you very much. No wonder they don't want what we have if all we have is a little religion sprinkled on our already too busy life. People are looking for reality. People are looking for something to commit to, something that's worthy to commit to. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about courage. Courage in the face of conflict. How many of you know we are in a spiritual war for our very lives? I find there are three types of Christians. Those who are winning the war, those who are losing the war, and those who don't even know we are at war. The enemy hates you, he hates Christ, and he's out to stamp out the church if he can. And if he can't stamp it out literally, then he will de derail it at every turn if possible. And he has various strategies that he employs to do it. Most American Christians frankly, don't have the courage to stand up and speak his name in the public arena, much at all. Again, I don't think it's we're bad people. We 
have allowed ourselves to be silenced, largely. Have you noticed that every kind of weirdness and sexual perversion is permitted? No, it is encouraged, celebrated even. People strut with pride, but Christians are afraid to open their mouths and take a stand. All it takes is some out-of-control judge somewhere to declare that what we're doing is illegal, and we passively go along with it, and we shut up immediately. The trouble is, it doesn't even take a judge to silence. It doesn't even take a judge to silence most Christians. All it takes is one raised eyebrow. These Christians were willing to die for him. Are you? Seriously, are you? Are you? What about you? What about me? We always wondered what we would do if we faced persecution. Well, guess what? Here we are. I want to go on record right now and tell you I'm willing to die for him. You may have to before this is over. What's more, as your pastor, I'm willing to die for you, and for this church, for the church of Jesus Christ. And what I'm looking for is a few good men and women who feel the same way. You give me a handful of men and women like that, I'll change this city. This city will change this country. I'm asking for three things. Courage, charisma, commitment. Now, if you just want namby-pamby religion with, you know, feel-good services, then this probably isn't the church for you. If you want low commitment, no charisma, ministry that requires nothing of you, no courage on your part, keep looking. Look somewhere else. But if you are sick of that, if you are sick to death of normal church in America, and you'd like to joyfully gather with other committed believers to be filled with God's Spirit, to be equipped to advance the kingdom, and you know what? We're going to laugh a lot in the process. We're going to have a pretty fun time in the process. If you're looking for that, you're in the right place. Welcome. <laughs> Let's embrace where God is taking us. Let's, let's see what God has for us in the days to come. Last week I mentioned just a few, and we're going to close here, getting, getting on. I believe that this is what God is saying. Mentioned it a little bit last time. I want to be a little clearer. I think God is saying to the church in America, it's time for you to arise. The whole world, everywhere I go in the world, it's like they have a different strain of Christianity than we do. It's the strangest thing. You go to India, you go to Ukraine, you go to Philippines, you go to the different places, and it's like they've got a different kind of thing partly because they are they understand they are a beleaguered minority they talk about paying a price they do every day but it 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 has produced something in them of reality and of and of realness it's it's a, it's astonishing it's really quite remarkable how cohesive they are how much they love each other Georgia and I have been there in India. We're lying in our beds at 5 o'clock in the morning. We can hear 200 people up above us that are gathering to pray every day. How Christians like that. 
<laughs> the funny part is they look at me as a spiritual giant. They can't wait for me to come up and preach to them. I want to tell them I need to learn from you. I'm sorry. I think God is calling the church in America to arise. Not rise up and get militant or weird, but just rise up and be the church. Be who God's called us to be. Fully committed to Christ. Fully committed to one another. Moving in particularly, I think, these four areas. One is unity. How many of you know our nation has never been more divided? Well, at least in my lifetime. I'm sure it was pretty divided in the Civil War, but in my lifetime, we've never seen the nation divided as it is the liberals and the conservatives, the Republicans and the Democrats, and, and men and women, and on and on. And it's just, there's just this division that's tearing us apart. How many of you know that you alone have the word of reconciliation that can bring this nation together? You have it. His name is Jesus. Only God can bring us together. Only God can unite us. Only God can heal our divisions. Let's get after it. Secondly, there's clarity. While we demonstrate love and a generous spirit towards those who disagree with us, we must not lose our eongelion, which is another Greek word. We translate that the gospel. We must the gospel, Ion Galeon, is a, it means a proclamation. It is what, it is what a runners for the king would arrive at a city and roll out a scroll and make a declaration in the name of the king or the name of the emperor, I declare to you, so on and so forth. That is an Ion Galeon. It is an announcement that is made on behalf of the king, and it is to go out to everybody so that everyone hears it. Okay, this is what the Bible describes as they have, the Bible has co-opted this word and, and it's now translated as gospel. You and I are to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, to make a declaration of Jesus. The proclamation of the good news of Jesus. If we soften our message to make it more acceptable to a world that is hostile to God, we may win the battle, but we will surely lose the war. On the other hand, if we speak the truth in love and call a dying world to a living Savior, some will hear and be healed. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There needs to be clarity. We don't need to get mixed up in politics. We don't need to get mixed up in all kinds of things. We need to declare the gospel. Are you with me? Thirdly, there is the power. The power we preach is that the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. Power to save, power to heal, power to fill, power to deliver, that kind of thing. We need to be about that. And finally, honor. We are a people who are creating, the church in America needs to create, recreate a culture of honor. Culture of honor, where we honor God. We honor each other. We honor... Jesus said, I, or, or God says, I will honor those who honor me. Culture of honor. And as far as Community Vineyard Church, I think God wants us to be change makers and bring hope, bringing salvation, bringing the power of God. This is what this is, that's what's happening this morning. 
just even in our worship time. People here that are hurting, that are needy, that are looking for a miracle, let's just bring, let's create an atmosphere which the Spirit of God is present and we can connect people who need a miracle, connect them to the God who is a God of miracles. God is saying, create the atmosphere and I'll show up. I'll be there. I'll be in your midst. And it doesn't have to be in these walls. It can be outside. It can be at the Walmart up the street, Walgreens up the street, wherever. Wherever people are hurting, wherever there is need. God is just asking, will you bring the power of God to a hurting world? Finally, we are to be peacemakers. We are ambassadors of peace, announcing that the war is over and Jesus is one. Come on, worship team. That's who we are. That's where we're going. I think this is where God is directing the church in these days. Are you in? How many of you are in? Amen. Let's all stand and worship God together. Because what are we afraid of? 
We're afraid of losing our lives, aren't we? We're afraid of losing our jobs. We're afraid of losing our reputations. The antidote, the opposite, is that we are not afraid unto death. That means that death cannot conquer us. Our lives, as Pastor Tom said, are fully committed to him. So what does death have over us? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. That means we get to go to glory. So if you have fear as you're facing your obstacles, please remember this verse. They did not love their lives unto death. And on a personal note, many know I am fighting the battle of my life. And I'm going to ask, not right now necessarily, but in your time. I am trying to live out this verse in bringing the gospel into school districts. And I have had to stand on this verse because I am having opposition from Christians and from the world. But you know what? It's God's will be done. That's all that matters to me. So I'm willing to give my life unto death for those who don't know Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost to me. As Pastor Tom said, if you're willing, stick around and join the fun. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I pray. I pray for the Kent school system. Lord, we tear down every stronghold of the wicked one. Lord, I think of Chicago Falls. I, I think of Akron. Lord, I, I think of Hudson. Lord Jesus, uh, Woodridge, Talmadge, Stowe. Father, I think of these school systems. Lord, I pray, tear down every stronghold of the enemy. And Lord, I may Jesus be Lord of all. Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, I pray now, bless my, my brothers and sisters. Bless this church. Father, we want to be strong. Lord, we need your charisma. Lord, we need the infilling of your spirit. And Lord, we ask for courage. And Lord, let that commitment rise within us. Father, we thank you now for all things that you're going to do this year, 2018, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you.